Welcome everybody. Today is February 17, 2023, and it's my great privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Francisco Gonzalez Lima, uh, George Sanchez Centennial Professor at the University of Texas, Austin. Um, Francisco, uh, please take it away. Welcome to the crowd. Thank you very much. I would like to thank everyone uh, for being here today and uh, sharing this uh, presentation with me. So I'm gonna start out by sharing the screen and uh, take it from there. So I assumed uh, you can see it now, right? Looks good. Good. So uh, this is the information I have to uh, acknowledge my institution at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, what I'd like to accomplish today is uh, these uh, four points. I would like to briefly introduce how enhancing brain mitochondrial respiration can promote uh, especially cognitive brain function today based on uh, what Paolo asked me to present. And I would like to also spend a few minutes uh, trying to promote the objective of understanding that in vivo photomodulation causes photooxidation of mitochondrial cytochrome C oxidase in the brain and show you a little bit of that uh, evidence. Then recognize transcranial infrared laser stimulation as a new, relatively new, non-invasive form of human uh, photoneuromodulation. And then review control studies of how this stimulation enhances mitochondrial hemodynamic and neurocognitive functions focusing on the one that uh, was done by Holmes. This is our, our, our overall approach uh, to this uh, type of phenomena of cognitive enhancement. We are been looking for interventions that can all target uh, brain mitochondrial respiration. In my earlier work, I use a pharmacological approach uh, with low dose uh, pharmaceutical grade methyl and blue, and uh, more recently have uh, been focusing on this uh, photobiomodulation, and uh, also done a uh, little bit of work, uh, but it primarily animal work uh, with uh, ketogenesis and nutritional interventions. So the common denominator is affecting mitochondrial respiration in the brain, and uh, in a more, uh, from the point of view of the neurometabolic mechanism, one of the things that uh, we have documented in animals uh, very clearly is uh, we can improve oxidative energy metabolism while at the same time increasing antioxidant defenses. And both neuroprotection and cognitive enhancement is something that uh, we show in animal models uh, extensively now. So in terms of human uh, work, uh, the basis for this is, as you know, is the neurons are highly dependent on oxygen metabolism for all of their functions. And we uh, have been using this particular type of laser stimulation at uh, 1064 nanometer wavelength to photooxidize uh, the photoacceptors in the brain and induce uh, neuromodulation and facilitate cognitive functions. In particular, our target is uh, cytochrome C oxidase. And we have been able now to, uh, for a number of years, to be able to follow that uh, changes in concentration as we go along with the laser stimulation. This is a very safe and non-invasive use of low power uh, laser that can be delivered transcranially to the cerebral cortex. If you don't remember anything else, uh, but I know you you all are very familiar with this in this group, uh, please remember uh, this. So transcranial infrared laser stimulation, what we're doing is uh, delivering infrared photons. These photons are oxidizing cytochrome oxidase, and this is uh, facilitating cerebral oxygenation, which leads to cognitive enhancement and neuroprotection. So the particular study that I'm focusing, focusing today is the Holmes et al. studies in Frontiers in Neuroscience 2019, 
the one that uh, Paolo requested. And uh, here, the objective was to investigate hemodynamic effects in the prefrontal cortex by which this laser stimulation enhances uh, cognitive functions using uh, near infrared spectroscopy, which is a very also very safe uh, non-invasive method to monitor hemodynamics in the human brain. So the study participants uh, uh, were 12 healthy adults in uh, which we measured these oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin changes, the differential effects between the two. Uh, and we also repeated these uh, uh, with 16 sham uh, controls without photomodulation. The site of uh, stimulation was in the forehead. Uh, here uh, is shown the four centimeter diameter of the site that we are stimulating. As you can see, the location is in, in the anterior prefrontal cortex. And the edge of the cap here refers to uh, where the cap that we're using to put the uh, sensors to follow the changes in the brain. The laser simulation parameters are spelled out uh, here for this group. Uh, they are very straightforward. It's, this is the kind of thing that we have been using now for many years. Then 64 nanometers, continuous wave. Uh, the the radium power uh, 3.4 watts. It can change a little bit uh, in the sense that. We monitor with a photometer uh, what is the actual output of the laser right before we do the stimulation, and we can make an adjustment just to make sure that uh, we get our target. And our target is to have 250 milliwatts uh, per centimeter square. This is the irradiance that, that we are targeting. We only have one point of stimulation here in this uh, region, and uh, basically, our total energy for uh, eight minutes of a stimulation is uh, 1632 uh, joules. This is a little diagram of how this device works, the functional near, near infrared spectroscopy and the timeline of the study. So we have uh, here in A, the timeline and uh, these abbreviations here are both face uh, down here. These are the two tasks that we're using. These are tasks that we've used in our previous studies that we have found sensitive to the transcranial infrared la laser stimulation. PVT stands for psychomotor vigilant task. This is a sustained attention task. Our main uh, measure here, for example, is uh, reaction time when individuals uh, can make a response. And then the other one, DMS, is a delay match to sample task, a working memory task. And we look at these before and after the laser stimulation. You can see there is, uh, the tasks are fairly short, five to six minutes. And uh, I must say that uh, one of these tasks, the delay match to sample, recently in a paper that came out and in the science advances, uh, they replicated, uh, in a way, uh, our findings uh, using the same parameters of a stimulation. Uh, they were able to also increase the correct responses in this task. And then the position of uh, the channels, uh, these, for example, these red and uh, yellow dots uh, here on the, on the surface of the head uh, represents the the, the red, the emitters, were, and the yellow, the detectors or sensors. And uh, we can use these uh, to calculate concentrations in oxygenated hemoglobin in red or deoxygenated hemoglobin. And uh, in this particular study, we only had uh, uh, what, what are called channels, uh, 20 channels uh, over the frontal part of the of the brain. Uh, in other studies, uh, one can have more channels. Uh, 
So the first thing that uh, we uh, were able to determine was, can you see the top of the slide here? Or... As we can see. Yes. Okay. Uh, because I cannot see it. There's, there's a bar. <laughs> no, let me see it. Uh, so we computed the, the cognitive uh, rate uh, score. Basically, this is uh, combining the, the uh, scores for the two tasks just to get a one, one cognitive score, the psychomotor vigilant task and uh, reaction time and the correct responses in the delay master sample working memory task. And the point here is to, uh, these are healthy uh, young uh, people that even in them, uh, one can improve uh, from before to after the stimulation, after eight minutes of the stimulation and get a significant improvement uh, in this uh, sustained attention and working memory. If you do the same experiment uh, with the individuals using a CHAM, in this case, uh, the same uh, setup, but uh, the light, only, only the red guiding light uh, was turned on, uh, they have absolutely no difference uh, from before to after. And respectively, these are 18 and 16 uh, participants in these uh, studies. The reason I'm presenting this is that uh, uh, cognitive neuropsychologists uh, insist that when you repeat this task, uh, there are practice effects that are going to affect the outcome of the task. However, we've never seen that uh, with this particular task. And this is another demonstration. Uh, this uh, replicates our original finding in 2013, where uh, when it was the first time that we used this task in conjunction with uh, laser stimulation. These are the changes uh, here. Uh, I'm gonna go uh, fairly quickly here. So these tables uh, represent uh, pre and post tilts for the, uh, the two tasks, the psychomotor vigilance and the delay match to sample. And if you wanna focus, uh, we can focus on the, on the two columns on the right. Uh, as you can see, the oxygenated hemoglobin, the first uh, row, uh, shows a very high uh, degree of significance. It has indicated with this very low uh, probability of uh, error. So here, the 0 0.001 in the, in the task. And uh, if we compute the effect size from a statistical point of view, that is the relationship not only with the mean change, but the variability of the change. Uh, this is a very high as high as, uh, as it gets. Uh, and at uh, the same time happens when we compute derivatives of this, but notice that the second uh, row, uh, HB, that's the deoxygenated hemoglobin. So the deoxygenated hemoglobin has a trend to decrease, uh, but uh, this is not a significant effect. So when you compute the total hemoglobin, uh, which is a measure of blood flow, you see that there is a significant change, also very high uh, effect uh, size. And however, one has to understand that uh, this is uh, improving because uh, of the increasing oxygenated hemoglobin. And as you can see, that uh, is, is what we call the differential uh, hemoglobin concentration. That is just subtracting the oxygenated uh, uh, minus the, the deoxygenated hemoglobin. So this is phenomenon is not simply increasing blood flow, which is I, so I emphasize this in, in a brain photobiomodulation. Bio, bio it is increasing oxygenated blood delivered to the brain. Of course, all the techniques that only measure blood flow, including uh, fMRI, like ball signals for uh, cere cerebral blood flow that I will show you uh, later, they can only tell you that there is an increase in blood flow. The functional near infrared spectroscopy can tell you that that increase 
is due to an increasing oxygenated blood. And that's an important difference because that, I think that this is key to why we're improving. If you just stop breathing, you get an increasing uh, blood flow to your brain, but that doesn't help uh, the neural tissue because what it helps is increasing blood flow of more oxygenated blood. So this is a demonstration here of how this phenomenon happens. The same thing happened uh, when you look at the working memory task and the same uh, large effect sizes. So this is a temporal sequence of how this happened in our setup. So when you uh, here, then I am focusing on the, the concentration of oxygenated hemoglobin, which is the one that is driving these effects. So if you look at free uh, laser stimulation, uh, you see that uh, during the task, there is an increase in this uh, oxygenated hemoglobin. These increases are, are the result of uh, the tissue activity that is demanding more oxygen from the oxygen consumption because these tasks were specifically selected because they're prefrontal based tasks. Uh, then we provide the eight minutes of laser stimulation and using the same baseline that we use for calibrating uh, at the beginning of this, uh, you can see that uh, immediately after the laser stimulation, uh, we're talking about a completely different uh, level. This is about five times uh, larger than the original change. You still can see some of the uh, increases that are related to the task, uh, but uh, the effect of photobiomodulation is much greater than the effect of the response to the activational task itself. This is the first time that this phenomenon has been demonstrated that uh, not only that we can improve the performance of the task, but that this is associated with this increase in uh, oxygenation of the prefrontal cortex. And so to summarize the results, uh, the main finding was the highly significant uh, hemodynamic effect of TILS on the change in oxygenated hemoglobin, total hemoglobin, and differential hemoglobin in the anterior uh, frontal cortex during this cognitive process. And that this region, as I mentioned, is a region that is engaged in the performance of this task. And uh, it was about five times greater than in the free tilt condition, and it was sustained for more than 10 minutes of cognitive processing. So as long as the cognitive processing was on, as long as we made recordings, uh, in a couple of subjects that we look for 20 minutes, uh, they were still uh, showing more oxygenation to the brain, even though the task was over and, of course, the stimulation was over. So study conclusions, uh, this was uh, study was the first to demonstrate that cognitive enhancement by transcranial photobiomodulation is associated with cerebrovascular oxygenation not just simply an increase in cerebral blood flow, but oxygenation of the prefrontal cortex. And they control the CHAM group, uh, behavioral data and hemodynamic data uh, show no significant difference at all in any of the pre-post comparison. So this serves to rule out that the laser effects were not due to pre-post task repetition or some other non-specific effects. So now what I'd like to turn my attention in this second half is to mechanisms uh, that may be underlaying this uh, effect on, on these cognitive functions. So I emphasize for other people that do brain stimulation that uh, TILS is mechanistically distinct from other forms of neuromodulation. It improves neuronal bioenergetics by a photooxidation primary process of cytochrome oxidase. And I will tell you a little more about that. So targeting cytochrome oxidase, we, we can photomodulate uh, any molecule that is a photon acceptor in the body. However, the key here is that this particular one is tight within mitochondria 
with the process of oxidative energy production. And that's what it makes a, a difference. And that's what it drives then by increasing oxy, oxygen consumption, it drives the delivery and hemodynamic response to deliver more oxygenated blood to the brain. So we're not talking about this being the only change that is happening due to light uh, being absorbed, but the change that is underlaying these bioenergetic hemodynamic changes. So basically, if you think of three steps here, the near infrared photons penetrate into the cerebral cortex. These are things that we demonstrated in various ways. Uh, and some of them, unfortunately, only in animals. Uh, and then they oxidize cytochrome oxidase, which is uh, what uh, I'm going to show you uh, in a moment. And because cytochrome oxidase is the major intracellular sector of photons in this uh, light range, uh, this phenomenon can go on by facilitating cytochrome oxidase being the catalyst of the reduction of oxygen to water. That, that is what we call oxygen consumption, allowing the mitochondrial respiration to produce more ATP, which is the energy source in uh, cellular metabolism. In particular, neurons are nearly entirely dependent on this type of aerobic uh, energy production. They don't have alternate ways of obtaining ADP. So cytochrome oxidase is uh, the rate limiting enzyme for this process. So cytochrome oxidase, when uh, oxygen concentrations uh, go low uh, locally, can also become a nitric oxide synthetase enzyme and uh, would produce uh, the release of nitric oxide and vasodilation of the local circulation. And this is what uh, we think is underlies this uh, change in the cerebral blood flow, oxygenated blood to the region. So summarizing, uh, TILs augment, uh, augment uh, CCO catalyzed oxygen consumption, ATP production, and NO mediated vasodilation. All of this process starting out with auto oxidation of cytochrome oxide, it's a cascade of events that is triggered. And eventually, this augmentation of uh, brain oxygen metabolism in vivo is what is resulting in these cognitive improvements. This is uh, when we demonstrated this. Uh, in the 2017 in the journal Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism. And let me start out by showing you the little uh, diagrams here with the red arrows. So after two minutes of starting the same stimulation that we use in this study that I showed you, uh, we get a significant increase on cytochrome oxidase, photooxidation. And uh, this, I mean, significant increase as compared to doing the same measurements uh, under CHAM conditions. And the same thing, of course, is happening with the uh, differential uh, hemoglobin, that is the increases that are happening. And we can see this phenomena here in the graph. Let me start with the graph at the very bottom. This is the one that showed the earliest change, the concentration of this uh, oxidized cytochrome oxidase. And uh, this may happen before we make the measurements, but uh, after the first minute uh, that we make measurements, uh, we already detect uh, this change as compared to the CHAM uh, non-stimulated uh, placebo. And as you can see, the changes progresses up during the eight minutes of stimulation. And when we stop the stimulation, and in this case, where well, we monitor for five more minutes, uh, we see still elevated levels of what we call upregulation of uh, cytochrome oxidase. And if we follow the same changes now in the, um, on, on the top uh, two diagrams, this is the oxygenated in A and on B, the deoxygenated hemoglobin. You can see the red line going up in a similar way, uh, but uh, slightly uh, behind cytochrome oxidase. So helping to suggest that there's a temporal causality of the photooxidation of CCO preceding the hemodynamic response. And again, it, it is sustained uh, 
the the uh, opposite phenomenon that seems to be happening here with the uh, deoxygenated uh, hemoglobin. You can see that that doesn't uh, doesn't change much at the beginning, but as time goes by, there is uh, when more oxygenated uh, blood is delivered, uh, we have a lesser proportion of deoxygenated uh, uh, blood. And eventually, uh, we don't see any difference. So this is uh, something that uh, that looks more like a trend uh, du during uh, many of the studies. And there's a large variability, as you can see here. And this is why some studies report uh, there's a significant difference in, in these and others done. And it's due to this uh, large variation. So it oscillates uh, just having a trend to being small, smaller. And then uh, this is uh, the model uh, the, the, in which we summarize uh, some of these observations. And here, let me start out with the diagram uh, here, B, uh, well, well, uh, where, where, where we show here like a drawing of a pyramidal neuron uh, inside the cerebral cortex, for example, in this prefrontal cortex that we were analyzing. And then uh, we, I make a close-up here on uh, one of these dendrites, this apical dendrite. And uh, inside this dendrite is uh, very rich in mitochondria, which are the ones that contain this cytochrome oxidase uh, enzyme in charge of this uh, respiratory uh, chain. And uh, if we look now a close-up of one of these uh, mitochondria here on the left side, I summarize here this uh, biochemical process uh, that is uh, initiated by the photons uh, photooxidizing cytochrome oxidase. What, what does, it, does it mean by photooxidation? Photooxidation is a very well known phenomenon uh, in the world of physics and engineering. Uh, metals are very particular uh, to become photooxidized, even though any material in which uh, photons uh, can induce the removal of electrons from their uh, orbits uh, produces photooxidation. Again, this is a general phenomenon of how light interacts with material in particular. Uh, however, what makes a cytochrome oxidase special here? What makes it special is uh, number one is the major photon acceptor inside cells. Number two, it is linked to the electron transport. So it is a molecule designed to move electrons through it. So when the photons uh, hit cytochrome oxidase, uh, it immediately delivers its electrons, cytochrome oxidase electrons, to oxygen, which is the ultimate electron acceptor in, in our known universe. And this is why the process of uh, accepting electrons is referred to as uh, oxidation. Uh, based on oxygen. So this is the first step and is a step that has been misunderstood in many of these reviews that I see all the time, and I'm going to mention many names, uh, where they talk about uh, uh, photomodulation affecting uh, CCO, but in a mysterious way. And no, this is not a mysterious way. We have, we have first in animals demonstrated this process, directly putting electrodes uh, measure oxygen inside the cerebral cortex and, and seeing the increasing oxidation, looking at the tissue, measuring quantitatively the enzyme in the tissue. And now with this technique of uh, broadband near infrared spectroscopy, we were the first to demonstrate this in uh, the human brain, the direct uh, effect on photooxidation of cytochrome oxidase. Then what happens later after cytochrome oxidase is oxidized, it's a phenomenon that is linked to this uh, process of uh, pushing out these electrons to oxygen, oxygen becoming water. Uh, so we say reduction to water and uh, the enzyme itself pumping protons. That is this uh, uh, little, the first arrow that I have here going down. These protons are pumped uh, into the intermembrane space so cytochrome oxidase uh, does this efficiently because it's embedded in the uh, inner membrane of mitochondria. So when it pumps the proton in the process of uh, 
reducing oxygen, these protons get inside this intermembrane space and the inner side of mitochondria, the matrix, uh, is more negative. So by electromotive force, these protons push out and, re and go back inside uh, the matrix. And they do that going through the hole, the channel of the ATP phosphorylate enzyme. So every time uh, one of these goes through, uh, phosphate is added to ADP to form ATP. And this is how we achieve then increasing ATP synthesis from the delivery of photons and the photooxidation of cytochrome oxide. But then the next uh, thing that happens is this uh, oxygen transport increase. And this is what we think is related to the uh, release of nitric oxide. When the oxygen levels uh, go down, uh, then the enzyme switches from catalyzes oxygen to water to catalyzes uh, nitrates into nitric oxide, which is another gas, just like oxygen. And it has only a local, very a small radius of action uh, near the mitochondria. So these mitochondria that are here in this uh, inside uh, this uh, dendrite will affect the capillaries nearby with this gas, and this will increase the delivery of blood by vasodilation to the area. And this is what we have measured uh, directly in the human brain. This increases in ox oxygenated hemoglobin, total hemoglobin, and differential uh, hemoglobin. So this summarizes these steps uh, here on the right. And I hope from now on, some of you uh, will address this uh, phenomenon this way and not in some generic ways of, especially people that are looking now at, at this phenomenon in an isolated uh, cytochrome oxidase in vitro preparation. None of this is gonna happen in, with the isolated enzyme. And then they're reaching confounding contradictory, erroneous conclusion that uh, cytochrome oxidase has nothing to do with this phenomenon. Anyway, very quickly here, I'm just gonna show you other consequences of this. When these electrical changes that are happening at the level of uh, mitochondria, dendrites are taking place, those pyramidal neurons produce changes in their electric fields in the, with the movement of these electrons and the ions that are moving along uh, the changes in voltage across the membranes. So one way to pick this up uh, is uh, using EEG. So we can measure EEG in CHAM and uh, transcranial photobiomodulation, modulation. And uh, we can, for example, uh, measure it uh, concurrently. And to summarize this, uh, if we, for example, follow uh, maps of these EEG changes in uh, alpha waves, which is one of the things that, that we see a difference between the CHAM and the uh, tilt response, is that uh, the, the first changes are only happening in this uh, prefrontal region, this anterior prefrontal region that we're stimulating. But as time goes by, uh, there is a network that gets engaged and posterior regions become uh, stimulated. So, so as you can see, as time goes by, uh, A minus, we see the maximal engagement. And this is one reason we select this for our studies. Uh, we see the maximum engagement. It's not only in the prefrontal anterior regions and parietal occipital uh, posterior regions, but now we start engaging more parts of the brain, including, for example, the, the anterior temporal regions. And then as times go by, uh, the phenomenon uh, becomes uh, more focal again in the anterior and posterior ends of the brain. And this is where we ended the simulation uh, for this EEG study, but we usually end stimulation at eight minutes uh, for our other studies. Notice also, that we're doing unilateral stimulation on the right side. This is the right hemisphere, the one that I'm pointing out here with the more yellow being the regions of uh, showing this significant change between CHAM and laser. But uh, notice that about this time, uh, a minute, the other part of the brain uh, also starts to become engaged. So the left hemisphere then starts to become engaged. 
and is not is not in the same location as you can see uh, because this secondary engagement that is happening here uh, is because of the network property, not because of the direct area that we provided the photon, but how that area is orchestrating all the parts of the brain in the same hemisphere and then contralaterally. Uh, and, Francisco, uh, um, yes. just a quick um, uh, reminder. So uh, we are kind of nearly 15 minutes to the end okay. of the hour. I see people are starting to ask questions. So I'll let you decide okay. uh, how long uh, you want to go. I will finish right now. So the, the, we have also demonstrated this phenomena using uh, fMRI, arterial spin labeling fMRI. But again, this all only uh, this measures cerebral blood flow as opposed to electrophysiologically. So here, uh, the area that we're stimulating here in the right hemisphere, you can see here at the cross of the uh, green cross, this area that is a uh, white uh, is the the one showing the greatest. Uh, blood flow to the region. And this is a, this is a study where we did uh, uh, six weekly uh, treatment with the TILs that I showed you. And uh, after the six weeks, uh, we compare the pre-treatment and the post-treatment fMRIs. And you can see that there is a whole network that become engaged here. Uh, this is a coronal section uh, through where this is, uh, largest change is happening in the blood flow. You can see it on the on the uh, right side. Uh, but also notice that the other parts of the brain become also engaged. In fact, this is a, a very good representation of the uh, these networks that we refer to as uh, the central executive network. The ones that are showing here on the lateral side of the brain involving this anterior prefrontal, areatoxidal region and some uh, anterior temporal areas but also becomes activated uh, here, for example, the posterior cingulate, which is uh, part of this uh, default mode uh, network. And that is very distant from the area of prefrontal stimulation. So that's it. I'm going to uh, leave it at this point, saying that the brain physiology critically depending on oxygenation for energy production and the mechanistic details of tilts are, are tied to this cognitive processing. By the brain. Thank you so much, Francisco. Very, uh, very inspiring. Um, I, if you want to stop sharing, I know uh, Joe had asked first to ask a question. Joe, if you want to go ahead and ask a question. Thank you for that great summary. Uh, I have a question on the F nears was taken on the right and left prefrontal cortex. Correct, but. The results were presented as a, a unified, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just curious, did they find a difference in the activation in each left and right prefrontal cortex uh, with these uh, stimulations? But, you know, because maybe the I don't know. I just wondered if they ever separated those data points. Thank you. Yes, uh, the, the answer is yes. Uh, but there was a temporal uh, difference. You know, the changes start happening first in the in the right, and then they they uh, move to the to the left. And uh, and yes, we summarize it in other studies. We had uh, directly, and uh, right now we we have a study uh, that we we finished that one. We are in the process of putting it together for reporting, where we directly compare right and left uh, stimulations uh, using uh, this uh, fMRI, F nears uh, technique. Uh, so that, to answer your question, yes, you start out. One of the important things about this uh, right uh, area, and this is contrary to what I thought when I started this, I am uh, one of my main expertise is functional neuroanatomy. And I thought I had to stimulate uh, the particular area of the brain that was linked to a particular function in order to produce an effect. And these studies that uh, we have done have shown that this is not uh, the case, that there is like, like an optimal phenomenon that happens when you stimulate the anterior prefrontal cortex, that especially the right side, and this is being found when you do uh, what is called functional connectivity studies 
and from effective connectivity study that the region of the brain that has the largest influence with all the other regions of the brain is the right anterior prefrontal cortex in the human brain. So if you want to orchestrate the symphony of brain activity, your orchestra director is the right anterior prefrontal cortex. So by giving you energy resources to your orchestra director, he orchestrates uh, the symphony of the brain, especially during a cognitive activational task uh, in, a, in an optimized way. Thank you. I, I see Attila, you had a question you want to go ahead and ask him. Uh, I uh, was, um, as I was listening to the, uh, the mechanism uh, that um, you know, the uh, CCO activation, I, oh, I th if I'm not terribly mistaken, that happens with 800, 810, 850 range, nanometer range. And so this is happening at 1064 as well. So I wonder if it's a uh, light at any wavelength is doing this and that it's um, only at these wavelengths it is uh, penetrating enough or is the, um, uh, or is this effect uh, wavelength specific if at all? Yeah, that's uh, one of those controversial questions. So let me uh, make two points uh, clear. One, uh, uh, in animal studies, uh, I have used all of these other wavelengths, you know, starting from 600s, uh, 800s, uh, 1000s. Uh, and uh, of course, there, I don't have a concern about the penetration. I can measure, you know, I go through the head of the rats, the head of mice, I can, I can uh, directly uh, measure this. Uh, sorry, my, my dog is in the background. Uh, and uh, it's a very protective German Shepherd I have here. Uh, and uh, he doesn't like it when people make questions that uh, that I don't like. <laughs> so in any case, uh, so my point is, uh, my second point is, uh, in the case of a human uh, human brain, 1064 is the only one where we have done this type of analysis. There is no other uh, group that has demonstrated this phenomena uh, with the 800s. Uh, in other words, they both oxidation or cytochrome oxidase uh, phenomenon. Uh, but I have no doubt that it's also happening. Uh, however, in some cases, uh, depending on the stimulation protocol or parameter, uh, they may or may not be enough for the particular uh, functions that you want to modulate. We have done, uh, in collaboration with the bioengineers, and computer scientists uh, models of how the different wavelengths uh, are penetrating and distributing uh, throughout the brain. And of course, what you put in the models uh, is what determines what your results. And some people out there have made models that are fairly incomplete. But one thing that we determine is the following. The main, uh, the main uh, purpose the main reason that uh, this uh, penetration differs uh, in the brain is due to the light scattering. Light scattering is the dominant determinant of penetration of light in tissues. And this is something that is being ignored in the literature also in photobiomodulation. They focus it on the absorption by a particular uh, photo a sector. That's not what determines the penetration. It's not the absorption profile of cytochrome oxidase. It is the longer the wavelength, the, le the less the scattering you have, so photons can get deeper. So that is different from absorption. Yes, 800 is uh, more part of a peak of absorption of uh, the enzyme cytochrome oxidase, at least in in vitro studies. Uh, it, we don't know this for sure in vivo, but if it doesn't, if the photons don't get there, it doesn't matter if that's the pick. Uh, you need to get the photons uh, to enter intracellularly in the region of the brain that you're targeting. 
And therefore, uh, it is a compromise to use the 1064 for the brain uh, of humans. Uh, however, uh, I don't see why not. In principle, uh, for example, 800 uh, will not do the same effects. Uh, uh, the only thing I can tell you is that the 900s do not produce the same effects. In our animal work, we haven't published all of this, but uh, when we measure at the M sign uh, directly histochemically, uh, it is always uh, 800 and uh, 1000, 1064. It is always better at stimulating cytochrome oxidase uh, upregulation than the 900 wavelengths. So that's the only one that I would qualify that there's something special about uh, that wavelength. And it's probably had to do with this uh, so-called small uh, peak of absorption by water in the 900 uh, nanometers. W would that uh, help? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Francisco. I also had a question. Um, so uh, you mentioned the papers from your group, uh, Wang and colleagues, uh, 2017. And then there had been the paper uh, from Tian as well and colleague. Uh, in collaboration with the group also of Henry Liu. Um, and uh, in those paper, um, you had demonstrated that that uh, um, TILS alone has this impact on oxygenated hemoglobin. In this latest paper, you demonstrated uh, the combination of TILS and uh, uh, the task has this effect. Now, um, is the effect greater when you combine the task and the um, transcranial infrared light, then what you get just with transcranial infrared light? Yes, uh, that's a good question. This is a very uh, important question that uh, people doing brain stimulation with all other modalities are always concerned about. You know, should you do it online? They refer to you know simultaneously or offline after you stimulate uh, with the laser. That my answer to this is the following. When you're stimulating across time, you still haven't given the dose that you're giving. You know, your, ra your uh, radiant dose, your energy dose, it, it happens over time. So it is not like turning on uh, an electric or magnetic field that you immediately are getting the, the dose uh, to the tissue immediately, instantaneously, this is not happening. Uh, these changes are happening slowly over time. So you have to wait till you reach whatever it was that energy level that you wanted to deliver to your tissue to do your testing. Uh, and uh, this is the reason this is not the same as other techniques. So uh, it is possible that uh, if you're doing the task while this is happening, you, you may not cease has effective effects because you still haven't delivered your dose. <laughs> you know, you, you started the task and uh, they, they, you know, it, you're just sli slowly just changing this parameter, the photo oxidation, the oxygenated blood. So um, by the time you finish with the task is where, where you have delivered the dose. And uh, so you actually, and as you, can, and as you saw uh, Paolo, when you stop the laser, these uh, events still remain uh, upregulated for at least for minutes. And uh, we're now doing a, a, a study where we are following these uh, in different time scales with the uh, FNIRs in a time scale, not only of minutes, but uh, days and, and weeks. Uh, and that is in, in process. Uh, but later on, you know, days and weeks later, it's a different phenomenon. It's a neuroplasticity that develops. And you can pick up that in a different way, not by measuring directly the same, but by measuring, for example, the functional connectivity in the prefrontal cortex and how that changes over longer period of time. So that's a study that uh, we, we are in the analytical phase right now. Uh, and, and, and I can uh, tell you that we, we already seen this, this. It's another phenomenon that happens uh, later on. And we knew this from the animal studies. We knew from the animal studies that days and weeks later, 
we saw changes that could not be directly related to the photons being there. Uh, so the, there is a cascade of event that happens. And, and um, by the way, these are not limited to these bioenergetic phenomena then, they will have an impact on all kinds of other uh, cellular functions as times go by. Uh, just like when you do exercise uh, and, and after you finish the exercise, you trigger a cascade of events that impacts all, all kinds of other phenomena. So I guess uh, uh, let me also um, come back with uh, um, a related question. Uh, so do you expect, uh, let's say, if we use uh, uh, transcranial infrared light for neurocognitive rehab, that the association with the task, uh, whether it's during or immediately after, as you suggest, would lead to even greater oxygenation than just uh, uh, transcranial infrared light alone? Yes, but not during, uh, after, immediately after. Uh, during, uh, no, because your task itself is consuming oxygen. Uh, and so if you're measuring brain oxygenation to that region, your task will be consuming the oxygen and, and, and your, your net result will be a combination of those two things, the tissue consuming oxygen and, and the delivery of the oxygen to the region. So you may not see has greater effect actually but uh, once you upregulate the system, because you see, once you trigger these changes, the hemodynamic response keeps going. It's going for minutes and minutes and it sort of amplifies. We get an excess of oxygenated blood with respect to the actual metabolic need uh, of the tissue. And uh, the first time I saw this in, in my career was uh, with my colleague, uh, Peter Fox, uh, during uh, brain surgery where there was an epileptic focus there, and you could see the congestion of all the blood, uh, red blood uh, around four minutes, half an hour after a small uh, seizure took place at uh, one spot on the surface of the brain. So this is an exaggerated uh, hemodynamic response that we have, that we actually can take advantage of and uh, unfortunately, what we found that this is somewhat uh, more compromised than in the older brains. So in the older brains, we had to find ways to improve vascular uh, responding to take advantage of this uh, hemodynamic effect of photobiomodulation. So photobiomodulation alone may not be enough. You know, if your arteries are fluted, the, the walls are thick, thick and uh, no longer elastic, so we, we cannot take advantage of this uh, phenomenon as well. But I assume, uh, and like every indication, this will have to be combined with some other way to improve uh, vascular supply to the brain. Thank you so much, Francisco. Uh, you know, you kind of explained it beautifully. Uh, and uh, thank you all for being here today. We went just a couple of one minute uh, over time. Um, Thank thanks you. again and uh, uh, to the next meeting.